Hello, potential heroes of Kavach. I'm Kato Genesis, and welcome to a little tips and tricks I decided to do for the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. It had been a whole six years since the last time I played Oblivion, and uh, I was a little rusty, uh, forgot a few things. So in some cases, while this is a tips and tricks I wish I knew, some of these are tips and tricks I wish I knew again because I forgot. My mind is not like a trap. Regardless of that, uh, these tips and tricks are geared towards first-timers taking their leap into the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. But even in saying that, some of you Elder Scrolls veterans might find some nuggets in here too. Even if not, perfect opportunity to share your knowledge about Oblivion in the comments below. You might notice that I'm using a couple of quality of life mods on screen as well, and if you're interested, my mod list is in the description. It's about time we get started though, so here are this many tips and tricks I wish I knew when I first began playing the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. Leveling up in Oblivion is a bit weird and old school and could be a bit confusing to first timers. I'll take a crack at explaining it here though. Firstly, and probably the most important, 10 increases to major skills in any order will result in a level up for your character. So the seven major skills you pick at the start will be tied to character level ups. As an example, say you picked Blunt as a major skill and raise it 10 times, you'll get a level up indicated by this icon here. Level ups in Oblivion are finalized by resting. So, finding a bed and using it is the next step after that symbol appears on your HUD. Yes, you can rack up several levels before resting, but I don't recommend stocking up on levels due to enemy scaling to the player. Once you do rest, you'll be presented with the level up screen, at which point you can choose three of your attributes to increase. You might be curious as to why there's bonuses shown for some of the choices and not for others, from plus two to plus five. These bonuses are caused by the skills you used last level, and the boosts go to their governing attribute. Using the previous example, if you focused on the blunt skill and raised it by 10 before leveling up, strength, the governing attribute for blunt weapons, will have a plus five bonus. The great part is that these bonuses can be gained by major and minor skills. So knowing this, technically, you can get a bonus of plus five to three of your attributes in one level up. I'm not suggesting min-maxing as a first time goal, but know that it's there once you get the hang of things. Like I said, leveling in Oblivion is weird and surprisingly challenging for me to explain, but I hope that cleared some things up about it. The base cap for all skills and attributes is 100. They can be raised past this, however, with magical effects like enchantments and blessings. Whether or not they actually help you pass 100 is worth looking at, though. All eight attributes still grant some degree of bonus if they're boosted past 100. For skills, however, it's only athletics and acrobatics that benefit from being raised over 100. Any other skill does not give more bonuses past 100. You'll notice that I didn't mention perks in the level up stuff, and that's because perk gain is just linear. Increase the skill enough, you get a perk, rather than getting to choose them from a list or perk tree. The novice perk, usually granted by default, is from skill level 0 to 24, apprentice unlocks at 25 skill, journeyman at 50, expert at 75, and master at 100. Many of these perks will be familiar, like a 50 in armor lets you use repair hammers on magical items, and 50 in a melee skill gives you a disarm chance to sideways power attacks. It is a bit disappointing that instead of picking perks, we just get them by default, but Oblivion still has some other fun customizable aspects. Even though enemies scale in Oblivion with stronger armor and weapon types as your level increases, the unique items in Daedric artifacts in the game largely don't, and have a fixed level of power. So, in the case of something like the Ring of Namira, it won't matter if you get a level 5 or a level 20, it'll still be just as powerful. Close quarters combat in Oblivion is pretty straightforward. Block incoming attacks, swing while the enemy is off balance, or bypass everything entirely and go the range route, and so on. This shouldn't be surprising to anyone familiar with first person RPGs except for fatigue. In the following game, Skyrim, this green bar became stamina and dealt with power attack and sprint management. What does it do here then? We don't have a sprint button. Your fatigue will go down when you perform actions that would normally make you exhausted, like jumping and attacking. Moving around at full speed doesn't drain fatigue, but does slow its regeneration. Now, if say your fatigue is forced below zero from an enemy's enchanted weapon or unarmed strikes, you'll be knocked unconscious and probably dead meat. Not only that, but fatigue also affects how much damage you do with melee and bow attacks. The lower your fatigue, the less damage you'll deal. In normal difficulty, you might not see this negatively impact your character very much in early game, but 
later on, there's some cruel enemy types that will take full advantage of your low fatigue, so this is just something to keep in mind. I'm not only telling you this for the sake of being cautious though, I'm also sharing this because enemies largely follow the same rules when it comes to fatigue. If you have a way of doing damage to the fatigue of your foe, you can reduce their own physical damage and even knock them out if they reach zero fatigue too. Power attacks in melee combat get more perks as you level their respective skills. Unfortunately, some of these focus on the sideways and backward power attacks, and those can sometimes become unwieldy depending on your character's speed. I do have a couple of suggestions to help with this. First, simply toggling your walk button, which will slow you down so you don't have to overcorrect with who you're trying to hit. Secondly, there's no active block bashing in Oblivion, so holding block while moving and power attacking can also help with this. Power attacks aren't the only thing that can benefit from holding the block button. Sometimes you want to sneak up and get that surprise attack or pick a bandit's pocket, but sneaking at normal speed can get you caught pretty easily, especially if you're wearing heavy boots at a low sneak skill. An alternative to toggling walk every time you want to be extra sneaky is holding your block button. Doing so will slow your movement and in turn reduce your chances of being detected by an unaware foe. Injured and low on healing items? Use the wait function for an hour. Generally, you have to be sure you're far enough away from enemies, but the distance needed is pretty generous. I tend to use the wait function even if I do have healing items since there's no penalty for it and you get fully recovered. And if you run into the glitch or issue of enemies always being nearby so you can't wait, simply quick save and reload and you should be able to use wait again. After finishing up a dungeon delve, try to make a habit of checking your active effects afterwards. Acquiring diseases and ailments can quickly rack up and even do damage to your stats until you find a temple or way shrine. If you have a disease called porphyric hemophilia and don't want to become a vampire, you'll only have three days to have that removed. For immediate effects of most diseases, there are potions and spells made for removal. If, however, your attributes and skills are damaged, shown by red numbers instead of green, you'll need to use a way shrine or temple to recover that penalty. A cool feature in Oblivion that some may not realize until they do a few quests is that seemingly most non-player characters in the Imperial City and surrounding towns have a daily routine or schedule they follow. This isn't just work and sleep. Some NPCs take breaks for meals, schedule time to converse with others, stay inside when it rains, go on their own adventures, and even take weekends off. For immersion's sake, this is a pretty awesome feature. Mechanically, some aspects of this can be exploited and are highlighted in many of the Dark Brotherhood and Thieves Guild quests. Aside from being able to steal from shops when the owners are sleeping, you can also pickpocket their equipment while they're asleep because they take their equipment off when they go to bed. You can replace their food supply with poisonous apples, making their next routine meal a deadly one, and even catch wind of rumors just by being an earshot of their conversations. There are examples of what some would call a poor execution of the system too, like having to wait till one day of the week to do a certain activity, but I largely consider this routine system to be a boon to the game as a whole. There are several factions you can join in this game as expected. The mages and fighters guilds are usually next to each other in town, color-coded blue and red respectively. You then have the more subtle factions. The thieves guild can be found by asking beggars about the gray fox, if they like you enough. The dark brotherhood will find you while you sleep after you've committed murder. You can also join the arena in the arena district in the imperial city for a jump start on a bit of gold as well as some equipment. Even if you don't feel like questing for these factions as soon as you join, keep in mind that these factions become friendly when you do join them, and you can just take about every item you see from them freely. Places like the numerous mages' guilds will have plenty of reagents and soul gems just lying around, free to take if you simply make introductions and ask to join. Equipment can be incredibly heavy. Strength, of course, helps you increase your overall carry capacity, and there's also the feather effect from a spell, enchantment, or potion that can give you a temporary boost. Once you do become encumbered, the weight of heavy armor and two-handed weapons are a given, Daedric weapons and armor being some of the heaviest stuff you can pick up. But the weight of arrows can also accumulate pretty quickly. A stack of 100 arrows will generally weigh around 10. So even if you are an archer type, be wary of how many arrows you're carrying at any given time, and mindful of the ones you pick up too, like the Dremora barbed arrows for example. They weigh two each, which is ridiculous since other arrows of the same damage amount can weigh 5% of that. Potions and reagents can quickly over-encumber you too. Each potion can weigh between 0.3 and 0.5. Healing and sorcery potions are a staple to keep on hand, but you probably won't need any more than 10 of each at any given time because you will probably pick up more too, depending on the dungeon you're going into. 
If you are looking for some gold early on in Oblivion, food and produce from innkeepers, gardens, and bartenders can be a decent source of money if they're converted into potions and sold back. This, of course, will level up alchemy in the process, too. If you're not looking to stain your fingers with reagents, Alien Ruins are consistently full of items that merchants will pay good coin for. The Blue Welkin Stones in particular are plentiful in these ruins and have a 50 gold value with a weight of 1. Do be aware that Welkin Stones are also useful for mage types, though, as they fully recover your magicka. The white Varla stones are larger and a bit more rare in the Aeliad Ruins, often requiring a puzzle or a button press to appear, but they do have a value of a thousand gold, so are definitely worth selling if you need gold more than you need magical items recharged. Unfortunately, there's no blacksmithing skill in Oblivion, so when you go dungeon delving into mines especially, the silver and precious stones you find won't really have much use beyond their ability to be sold, so that's another option. Once you start traveling through Oblivion Gates too, those will also be full of enemies with enchanted loot and other items worth selling. While we're on the topic of selling items, haggling is something you're introduced to early on in tandem with the Persuasion minigame. The minigame is straightforward enough, just time-consuming. What you'll be trying to do is trying to activate the biggest slice when they're grinning like an idiot, and the smallest one when they're frowning like you stole their sweet roll. Faction merchants are great to make return trips to, since joining most factions should give you a jump start on their disposition. Even if you don't have a natural favor with them, you can give yourself an unnatural favor with the charm spell of any duration to skip and bypass the persuasion minigame entirely. Since dialogue freezes time in the game, you won't have to worry about it wearing off until you're done with your transaction. Gaining favor translates to better deals through haggling, so if money is tight, using that natural or unnatural charm can save you lots of gold. When you do sell things to a merchant too, the merchant gold amount displayed is the maximum you can get per transaction rather than their total gold. I think this system is lovely because it means you don't have to go to a bunch of merchants to offload all the things you want to sell and maybe just like one or two instead. Throughout the side quests and main quests, you'll occasionally gain temporary essential followers, the essential status shown with the crown icon when you look at them. These essential followers, like Joffrey and Martin, can help in other quests besides their own, so long as their objective is incomplete. You can even bring them along with you to close random oblivion gates. There are a couple downsides to adventuring with temporary followers, however. Since durability is a system in oblivion, temporary followers' equipment can also break, which can reduce their combat performance if they have a melee focus. NPCs also like running wildly around each other when they fight, making them easy to hit by accident with attacks, especially ranged ones. Sometimes it is just nice to have more bodies on the field though, and they can definitely help with that aspect when available. Due to the sporadic nature of combat, when there's allies on the field, if a friendly starts attacking you because you hit them by accident, you can yield to them by holding block, then pressing whatever your activate button is, the one you use to talk to them. Maybe this was mentioned while escorting the Emperor, but I don't recall that. So I'm leaving this in in hopes that it helps at least one person who would be tempted otherwise to look it up. Cyrodiil is a regularly haunted place, but that's only a bad thing if A, said spirits are hostile, and B, if you don't have any magical weapons or offensive spells. Normal weapons and arrows will pass through ethereal types, such as wraiths and ghosts, so having some form of magical assistance will help take care of them. Keep your eyes peeled for silver and daedric weapons, as they have the benefit of not needing to be enchanted to be effective against ethereal beings. Also, if you have a magical weapon but it's out of charges, don't worry, it will still be effective against a ghostly enemy. You're going to go through a lot of magical equipment, and it's great right up to the time you realize you've used up all of an item's charges. So how do you keep them charged? First, and the most expensive, is using a guild mage's recharging services. Each guild has one of these individuals who will recharge your magical items for a lot of gold. The second option is using Varla Stones from Aeliad Ruins. These recharge all of your magical weapons when used, not just one at a time. As I mentioned before though, they also fetch a decent price and are a great source of gold early game. The third option is when you take the recharging into your own hands. Get yourself a soul trap spell and some empty soul gems, then use soul trap on enemies when they're near death. Once you finish them off, if a soul gem you have can hold their soul, it will be captured in that gem. After you have filled those soul gems, you can then use them for recharging. There is a Daedric artifact here in Cyrodiil that makes soul trapping less tedious too, so keep an eye out for Azura's Shrine. 
Oblivion makes it easy to use magic in tandem with any build thanks to a dedicated spell button. Magicka can be as simple as your minor healing resource, but there's so much more that you can do with Oblivion's magical sandbox. In my mind, there's no reason why you shouldn't use at least a little bit of magic in this game. In fact, there's one major feature in Oblivion that should help convince you to use more magic, and that's spell making. Joining the Arcane University after becoming a part of the Mages Guild and finishing their lengthy recommendation quests grants you access to the spell making altars, where you can create your own custom spells by making use of any spells your character already knows. With spell making, you can customize whether your spells are projectiles, on touch, or self cast, what kind of duration or magnitude they have, and even combine schools of magic to a degree. Beware though, once you get in deep with spell making, it becomes very easy to break certain aspects of the game, but that's sometimes part of the fun. Since there might be some spell casting in your future, might as well talk about how to cast them quickly too. Casting spells while holding block is the quickest cast time you can get with spells. Couple this method with touch spells, which have the fastest cast time already, and you'll be palming enemies to death with terrifying efficiency. Whether you make Restoration a major skill or not is up to you, but Restoration does have this habit of taking an insanely long time to level up even with a passive boost. Unlike Skyrim, however, no hit point damage is actually needed to gain Restoration experience, so you can cast healing on a perfectly healthy character or yourself and still gain skill experience for it. Since magic is a big part of the features Oblivion has to offer, becoming a part of the Arcane University also grants access to enchanting altars as well. If you've made use of enchanting tables in Skyrim before, these should feel pretty familiar. Uh, you can use the enchanting altar to enchant weapons and armor with spells that you know, and as expected, they do require a filled soul gem to create. Being enchanting isn't a skill you can increase in this game, however. There is another option. Sigil Stones are the final reward each time you close an Oblivion Gate, and grant a one-time use enchantment from a randomized pool. If you don't want to put too much trust in the RNG, Sigil Stones can be re-rolled so long as you save before you get kicked out of an Oblivion Gate. All you need to do is activate the Sigil Stone, save, and check your inventory as it appears. If you don't get a Sigil Stone with the resulting enchantments you desire, simply reload until you do. This of course is a mild save exploit, so if this does feel a bit cheap to you, do keep in mind that you can see up to 60 Oblivion Gates in your playthrough. You'll have plenty of randomly generated Sigil Stones by the end. If you have any tips of your own or questions about the tips that were listed, please leave a comment down below to help each other out or get some more info. If you found this entertaining, useful, or both, please do whatever you see fit to show that. And among the things you can is by supporting on Patreon, like my Wayside Legends, Sven and David Hoover, as well as the rest of the supporters on screen now. Even if not, I'm just glad you're here. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Kato Genesis, and may you wander Cyrodiil like you own it.